So you were you were working on MBOs, and how did the limited partnership structure then come about? Well, that was another friend of uh, Stanley Berwin. I just attended. In fact, he left me alone in a meeting um, with a guy called uh, uh, Gordon Dean, who uh, was setting up a, a venture capital fund. And uh, he had a list of requirements that he wanted it to uh, meet, uh, which I didn't know at the time because I didn't know anything about venture capital funds, uh, were unusual. Uh, the first one of which was it had to be Onshore UK. And at that time, to avoid the double charge to capital gains tax, so, you know, the natural structure would be a company. If uh, uh, investors invest in a company and the company then buys another company, uh, the, the target business, you know, the only way of getting the money out is through two layers and you end up with two layers of tax or at least an additional layer of tax. It was felt right that one shouldn't be subject to that, uh, it shouldn't be any worse than investing mm. in the companies directly. Uh, he said he wanted uh, that, he wanted a, uh, a, a, a tax efficient carried interest efficient management charges, a whole uh, easy to operate, a whole list of uh, uh, requirements. I hadn't, didn't have a clue. Um, Presumably no, nobody did because no, no one had come up with that for U uh, the UK before. Uh, uh, that's right, yes. As far as I know, they hadn't been used. Mm. As far as I knew at the time, uh, uh, they might not have been used anywhere. Anyway, I was uh, uh, sitting and talking to uh, this guy and uh, uh, Stanley Bowen popped his head round the door and uh, I said, well, look, here's your friend and he uh, wants to do a, a, a venture capital fund. Uh, and Stanley uh, uh, gave him all the requirements and Stanley said, why don't you use a limited partnership? And he left the room. Uh, and I'd never heard of a limited partnership. I mean, they were sort of a footnote in the, uh, in the textbooks at university and nobody ever focused on them. Uh, I thought it was a stupid idea, but I didn't dare uh, question him. So I instead spent weeks sort of uh, to trying to understand what a limited partnership was, uh, configuring it to uh, uh, a venture capital fund, trying to understand how I didn't know what a carried interest was, uh, uh, but trying to understand the carried interest and again trying to work out uh, how uh, to make that efficient. It wasn't very difficult because the underlying profits were capital gains and all I had to do was make sure that the structure in between didn't change the nature of those uh, profits from capital gain to some sort of income. Um, uh, but the limited partnership, uh, being sort of tax transparent, sort of achieved that very naturally. Um, Can you remember what terms you used in that? Like, So everyone these days knows about the... Two and twenty, and yeah, in those days, I think it might have been two and a half and twenty for a standard. You know, this, right, but roughly the same the, the, kind of yeah, model. Yeah, yeah, oh, they're very, very similar to mm. what they uh, what they are now. I mean, uh, uh, at that this particular fund was two million pounds. I think Apex uh, had, uh, which was then called Alan Patrickoff Associates, had uh, just closed a fund for ten million pounds. So you know, the whole industry was much, much smaller to, uh, than what it was now. Mm. And so uh, two and a half percent was uh, thought to be necessary. Yeah. And you had to submit a budget to your investors to show that it was uh, justified. Do you remember how, who came up with that? Or was that, was that part of the limited partnership structure in the textbooks, the fee level and the oh, no, carry level? No, not at all. I mean, limited partnerships in the textbooks were uh, sort of used for farming. Uh, right. They hadn't been used for uh, investment structures. Indeed, you know, one of the first questions was whether um, making investments in parallel uh, through a limited partnership, whether that was a business at all, um, because there were dicta in some cases that said mere co-investment is not enough. And so we had to sort of uh, work out, is this a mere co-investment or is there a business going on here? And we sort of decided the latter, but, you know, who are we to decide? So, uh, we submitted, having sort of worked out a, a structure, I say we, but really it was me, um, uh, we submitted it to uh, uh, leading council, um, you know, who's experienced in uh, uh, arguing tax cases in the courts, and they could give a sort of uh, idea of what 
if it ever came to it, they thought the courts might decide. He blessed it, and uh, so uh, armed with an opinion from leading counsel, we, 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 we used it for the first time. When was, did the tax issue come to a head? When, when did you have to actually engage with policymakers uh, and prove, prove the case? Well, not long after, uh, the government had got in touch with the BVCA, the Department of Trade and Industry, um, and the uh, Inland Revenue, uh, both as then called, um, uh, got in touch with the BVCA and they sort of said, well, look, look, we like what you're doing. We're proud of this emerging industry. Uh, we're not necessarily keen on your doing it through offshore structures. Although, you know, they did make it clear that they understood that uh, the uh, double charge to capital gains tax was not a fair outcome of using an onshore structure. Mm. Uh, there was a sort of terminology that... Uh, uh, was used uh, about trying to avoid a technical knockout. In this terminology, avoiding a technical knockout was not not tax avoidance. It was something that uh, was fair to do, yeah. and uh, uh, the revenue accepted that that was fair. By the time we had been uh, were invited to uh, discuss this in front of the. Uh, uh, the Treasury, um, uh, the then Financial Secretary to the Treasury, Norman Lamont, who then went on to become Chancellor. I went there with the BVCA and we talked it all through and you know, we uh, discussed uh, whether uh, it was a business in the first case and, uh, and they, uh, because otherwise it, it couldn't be a partnership. And they actually had different ideas of how uh, it should be structured. But I think we all agreed uh, that a limited partnership would be better than other structures. Um, so who's in the room at this time? Norman Lamont, people from the Inland Revenue, me and uh, the then chairman of the BVCA, who was uh, uh, John Nash, who... Uh, uh, now Lord John now Nash. Lord Nash. And that was, so that was the point that <laughs> the limited partnership really became the legitimate format for venture capital investment in the UK? Yes, but not before uh, me getting sort of grilled as to whether the tax outcome for the carried interest was fair or not. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the revenue said, well, look, if captains of British industry are paying tax on their, uh, on their income, uh, income tax on their income, uh, why uh, shouldn't uh, venture capitalists? And I said... Uh, because it isn't income, it's capital gain being channeled through uh, a limited partnership. Uh, and so we were sort of uh, going to and fro on this question, which, uh, as you know, <laughs> remains a hot issue uh, until today. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, at, at one point I sort of took my courage into my hands and said, look, uh, if you're not going to agree this... Um, I would imagine that uh, people will go on using offshore structures. Why wouldn't they? Because you can uh, achieve a capital gain quite easily using an offshore structure. And so again, uh, uh, Mr. Lamont uh, looked at me and looked at the revenue and said, do you mean, Mr. Blake, if you use an onshore structure, if you use an offshore structure, rather, you can uh, achieve capital gains tax uh, treatment for the carried interest? And I said yes, and I sort of had to explain um, exactly how to do it, which itself felt a bit risky because, uh, you know, it's one thing to have the opinion that something works. It's another thing to uh, declare it publicly um, and invite everybody to scrutinise it uh, and, and find reasons why uh, it doesn't work. But, you know, I, I decided that was a risk worth doing. You have to understand I had at this point six or seven clients who I had advised it did work to. So looking yeah. back on it, it might have been even a breach of trust for those clients to start telling the Inland Revenue uh, and the government exactly how we'd done it, even though we did believe the outcome was correct. So I explained it and uh, uh, Lamont turned to the Inland Revenue and said, is what Mr. Blake said correct? And they said, uh, yes, Um that's all I heard at that point. And he asked me to leave the room and wait outside. <laughs> Waited outside for, uh, must have been 15 minutes. It was quite a long time to be standing outside a room. Uh, and then I was invited back and uh, the head guy from the Inland Revenue said to me, look, I think we can do business together. 
Uh, so we ended up uh, uh, creating what was called, I think it still exists, the Statement on Guidelines on the Use of Limited Partnerships as Venture Capital Investment Funds. You know, within that, we set out model terms pretty similar to the terms as they are now, uh, you know, given that these funds were uh, so small, which uh, was uh, two and a half and 20 rather than two and 20, but we had to sort of open up our budgets to uh, uh, to investors to uh, to show why we needed two and a half percent and said two and a half and 20, uh, two and a half percent of commitment for the uh, for the management fee and 20 percent of profits for for the carry and quite a few other terms and conditions were set out in that i'm told now i didn't know it at the time uh tony lorenz um ronald cohen some of the titans of the venture capital industry were and john nash were telling me what the standard terms and conditions were and I put them down and I'm told that until then they weren't as standard as I was led to believe they were but that after that because they were in a document uh, blessed by the Inland Revenue uh, and some people felt that unless you mm. followed every you know everything precisely I don't think that was the case because we were setting out and we all agreed that we were just setting out what we believed the law was not uh, trying to change the law because you need a uh, you need a statute to do that. Uh, so we were just setting out what we all agreed the law was. In the best tradition of kind of common law and declaratory law, just observing what is the standard yeah. and then articulating yeah. it. Uh, so as I say, uh, I don't think people had to adhere slavishly to the mm. model terms that we did, but people did. Yeah. And so the two and 20 uh, or two and a half and 20 as it started, mm. it got sort of negotiated down fund by fund over mm. many years but uh, you know that became the standard terms and conditions and they're pretty much uh, the terms and conditions that exist today it's amazing ha from a bird's eye view uh, how little has changed well it, it is amazing so that must be the most uh, influential <laughs> policy meeting in the history of european uk european private equity and venture capital and the amount of value that has been created i mean it's you can't prove a, a negative but who knows if you hadn't uh, convinced yeah, them yeah. and it was treated as yeah. as, as profits and income yeah. um, what the industry would look like yeah. today. I mean actually. people say all sorts of things about private equity these days but in those days uh, you know there was no doubt that it was quote a good thing we're investing in say that buyout of the the battery division of Ever Ready saving the people from redundancy mm. helping them set up a business uh, uh, in that case uh, tax advantaged money yeah. You know, uh, then setting up funds uh, to uh, enable other people to do similar things, um, you know, was all thought to be uh, a good thing. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed a position for some time where I could just ring up the Inland Revenue and say, because, uh, you know, a particular client would say, well, you know, if we do to two percent rather than two and a half percent is it still is it still tax efficient and i would i would say yes but they would be nervous and so i would ring up the inland revenue with them and they would the inland revenue would say yes it still works <laughs>